All right, thank you so much students for joining us today. We are very excited to be having um, what I believe is the fourth or fifth installment of a week of panels um, as part of our Road to Residency program. Uh, my name is Cameron Matthews. I am off camera. I'm one of the founders of the Tour for Diversity in Medicine, and I work with SNMA and LMSA to bring this program together now for the third year in a row. We started during the pandemic, um, just when residency applications shifted to a virtual life, and it was very nerve wracking for a lot of our students. And so we wanted to bring about some sort of support for our fourth year graduating students. Uh, and set up these webinars as well as mock interviews for students and it has gone just increasingly well from year to year. So here we are in the third year and we are hosting specialty based panels and tonight I have the pleasure of introducing and and having a conversation with uh, two amazing physicians that are here to literally answer every question you might have. This is probably one of the few times that you can just lob questions out there and just uh, have it in an unpressured environment. We have uh, Drs. Jonathan Tolentino and Dr. Erica, Eric Ayers here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, give a little bit of background, and then we're just going to jump into it. Let's just talk about what is the best piece of advice to give a graduating student who is going into internal medicine and peds. I mean, this is, I'm a family doc. I admit I'm a little bit biased, but I need to hear this. I really want to hear this because I get this question all the time. What do I need to tell my students? So Jonathan, why don't you go first with introduction? Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely honored to be a part of this panel today. And, and I'm very excited about talking about med peds and, and I'm bringing some amazing medical students into our field. Um, I am the program director here at the University of Miami. Um, and I've been um, practicing med peds now for um, over a decade and have been a program director and been in medical education my entire time since I've left residency um, uh, back, in, uh, uh, back in 2010. And um, you know, I absolutely love this, I love this field because of there's so many amazing things that we do in the world of med peds. And most importantly, um, uh, it's a really great place to be able to um, do amazing things, be very flexible, and um, really see the full gamut of what it really means to be able to care for an adult and a pediatric patient in both the inpatient and outpatient realms and really developing that really specialized skill set. Um, and, you know, because of that, um, what we are able to do and what we're able to see, um, we see um, the best things about ha what happens in medicine, but we also see where systems fall apart and where um, where um, we as in medicine um, uh, have uh, fallen short in terms of how we care for our patients, how we fare, pair, um, care for our communities. And I think um, MedPeds has this very unique lens in which we're able to actually see a lot of these, um, a lot of these and um, um, these issues that um, uh, that many of our colleagues, both on internal medicine and pediatrics throughout the hospital, um, uh, can't see us holistically just because of the nature of us being able to see multiple different settings and, and the lifespan from that standpoint. And, and that's what I love about this field. And um, you meet some amazing, amazing people. You meet some amazing mentors. Um, you know, Eric has, uh, Dr. Ayers has been in, in the med peds world for quite some time and, um, and, and has been a mentor for many, um, many, uh, many, many residents. Um, I've known about Dr. Ayers, oh gosh, <laughs> for quite some time and, and the work that he's, um, he's done in, um, in Detroit. But I think this is one of the most amazing things about being in the med peds world is that you have some amazing advocates and you have some of the most amazing physicians and leaders. And um, it's been an absolute privilege to be a part of that. Um, so I guess before I get too far into um, the things to look for and look out for in med peds, I, I, I want Dr. Ayers to introduce himself as well. So sorry, I just rambled for no, a while. No, no, no. <laughs> that was great, Jonathan. I, I'm Dr. Eric Ayers, and uh, I am a program director and been one for many years uh, at Wayne State uh, School of Medicine. Uh, I love what I do, and there's not a day that I don't find something that's challenging and exciting. Just as Jonathan said, I think that uh, MedPeds allows us to do multiplicity of things. But I think the biggest thing I would say that uh, one of the things of MedPeds is we like our cake, cake and eat it too. Um, and I think that uh, as, uh, as was alluded to, why MedPeds, why us? It is somewhat that we want to be internists and we want to be pediatricians, but in taking on that role, we want to see the best of the best and the worst of the worst and those things in between. I think because of our skill set, we're um, excellent in dealing with some of the issues that 
um, either pediatricians, adolescent physicians, or um, community physicians may not be one to deal with, with the social um, aspects of health um, to include substance use and abuse and uh, all the things that go within that realm from tattooing to, uh, to piercing and the side effects and the adverse events that can occur with that. We also deal with transitions of care and that transition care is not to hand off in the hospitals, but it's transitioning a patient from seeing their pediatric subspecialist to adult subspecialist and we are that integrated bridge that's there. Um, and, and, and because of that, there's a great need because there are, are places that patients fall off because of not being transferred or transitioned correctly. I, one of the examples uh, is diabetes, that diabetes care becomes uh, come disjointed at the age of 18 if they're not a, quote, uh, adequately transferred to an adult provider that is willing and ready to take care of them. Same thing can be said about sickle cells. If it's not a comprehensive sickle cell clinic, then those patients will be lost in a transfer. And sometimes in an urban city where there is a sickle cell clinic, they will adapt to the going to that sickle cell doctor for their sickle cell disease as their primary care doctor. That may not be the place that they need to go. So there are many voids and many avenues that we can, we can fit and fit in. As far as, uh, I'll go into dive into one of the questions is why MedPeds beyond just what I said. I think that uh, MedPeds is, uh, it is a smaller uh, group of residencies. Um, uh, we don't have as many as there are in family medicine. Yes, we do equivalent to what's two years in medicine and two years in pediatrics, but we do pay attention into the, the core specialties of medicine and in pediatrics, which means we do cardiology, we do intensive care, we do neonat uh, NICO, neonatal intensive care, we do newborn, um, we do community medicine, um, we have continuity clinics, depending on where you go, those clinics may be weekly or um, in a block rotation every four to five weeks, depending on where you go. Um, and as I started to allude, we are starting to then take on the role of transitionalists, as I call us, um, where we are assisting in the transition of care from one discipline, the adult discipline, and from the pediatric discipline to the adult discipline. There are some misgivings of MedPeds, and, and I, I'll throw this out and then I'll hand it over to Jonathan. There's always this belief that MedPeds are at the top of the academic chain when it comes to academic. And so there are a lot of people, particularly those of color or URMs that may say, I don't have the scores. I think that the things that MedPeds that we as program li directors like is we want people that are down to earth. Um, if you were to do an improv survey between, uh, it, for those things that are in EROS that we look at, I would say that gold GHHS is one of the things that we do look for as being important. Why? Because we look for our residents to be immersed in doing the service of the community, being humble, um, being, uh, 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 and that humble isn't being able to advocate um, being able to listen, um, because those are all qualities of a good prof uh, professional physician. So if you were to say some of the qualities of not knowing everybody's application, that is one on the EROS, I think that we would say uh, we do pay attention to. And not that AOA is not important, I'm not going to say that, but I would say that when we look at service and service learning and service to the community and what you are looking for, that's one of the areas that MedPeds loves and, and enjoys too. Uh, saddle onto it, if I can say that. So I'm going to hand off the baton to Jonathan, and then we'll keep running together. So. Yeah, no, and you know, um, to, um, to to Eric's point, um, it's one of the privileges that we do have as MedPeds program directors is um, we know that the pool of MedPeds applicants isn't as large as say internal medicine or pediatrics or even family medicine, and because of that, we have this we have this privilege of being able to actually read through every um, every person's application. So. Um, one of the things that I really love about the application process is that even though it seems like there's 300, 400 different applicants that, that come through and apply to our residency program, I get to learn about each one of them and I get to read about what they've done and, and their accomplishments and um, the amazing things they've done from a research standpoint, leadership and community service. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of fun because you're like almost living vicariously through the amazing things that each one of the medical students have done. And, um, you know, I wouldn't have any other way as a program director to be able to actually read through the applications and really understand um, each applicant and really understand things holistically. And, you know, given, um, given the privilege of being able to actually read through each application um, thoroughly, it does give us a, be a better sense, better understand um, not only the motivation, but also understand those things that often aren't captured through board scores, aren't captured through your clerkship scores, 
but they really are captured through your narratives and through your letters of recommendations and more importantly your personal statements and so one of the things and eric and i have, have talked about this in the in in the past is your personal statements should be personal and not from the same point of why not only why do you want to be med peds but it's a really great way for you to actually spend time highlighting and showcasing who you are as a physician and in and uh, and many times highlighting that one activity or that one thing that you're so passionate about that this was the reason that you went into Madison and this is the reason why MedPeds made sense for you um, because we all have a story and um, and we all talk about how medicine is about understanding stories yet we have uh, but yeah, applications are are full of things that aren't stories and except for your personal statement so um, let that personal statement be the way for you to shine and really be able to highlight those things that won't come through a P on, on a random exam in some random class, your first year of medical school, but really being able to highlight those stories that make you that physician and, um, and really bring out the best of who you are as a med piece physician. I, I would just, I would just, I would just, <laughs> I would just echo that, Jonathan. I think that that's the unique part is that we get to pay attention to what you put your efforts in. And because of the volume, we get to pay attention to that. And in that, you should also highlight, uh, I always tell students, never really try to highlight when you've made a mistake. And, and Jonathan knows I try to highlight how you've gotten over that or what you learned from those life uh, situations. And that's even uh, as an undergrad stumbling into the field of medicine. Tell us what you've done, because we're looking at what is your skill set? How do you handle adversity? Uh, when that patient is down and needs you, are you going to be able to to formulate and think about a process to take care of them, or are you going to say, oh, I don't have the accessibility, I don't have the background. And so those things, they come through in a personal statement. The other thing is that you're more than just that personal statement. So really dive down and think about what is it that makes you tick, what makes you unique, because that's what we want to know. Um, one of the things that we're trying to assess when we interview is how you would fit into this other group of individuals that we already have on board. And will you bring the energy that we, we, we need to continue to thrive and develop and have a program? The other thing is that sometimes in those personal statements, there are unique skill sets that we may value or need for our program. And so that's where we, we start to find out about them. And then they will, you have opportunity to elevate it and talk about them uh, during the interview process itself. So um, please pay attention to uh, your personal statement. And lastly, before I hand it over, uh, because we have a real live resident on this, um, is that at some institutions, they ask you to give uh, three word descriptors to describe yourself. And I really tell when I'm advising for the MSPE letter, because that's where it shows um, that those descriptors should be transformed to everything that people see and, and, and think about. You. That it's not just three words that you pick out of the sky, that those three words should be encompassed in the evaluations that people have written about you. Those three words should be in how you describe your personal statement because they're more than three words. They are who you are. And so we're looking, when you have to do many applications go through and decide, we're looking for those where everything is completed, okay? Where we don't have to ask any questions that there's not, well, what does this mean or what does that mean? And we, the, the good thing is that we're small enough that if we do have those, we can call each other, but we're looking for who you are and what it, are you gonna bring to us? And, and so don't hesitate to describe or use those descriptors in a way that totally describes you, because um, that's what we're looking for. So. I will hand it off. Go ahead. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Anime Obo. I am a second year um, at the University of Miami Jackson. Um, and Dr. Tolentino is my program director. Hey, how are you? Hello. Um, I wanted to kind of like um, hop on to one of the points that you made, Dr. Ayers, which is um, you, I, th I think you almost said privilege in regards to adversity that people have like had to overcome. The way in which you are able to speak to the things that you've experienced and the fact that you're still here you're still at the point where you're getting ready to apply for residency or you're considering applying for residency as third years, um, that, that is like a, 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 a resilience privilege of sorts that you can always, you can speak to that in a way that doesn't seem um, 
I think one thing that I say to my mentees is like, you are not a failure. You have experienced failure. And the beauty of experiencing failure is that um, you can use it to become a more vulnerable individual, someone who is more emp empathetic or sympathetic to the needs of your patients. And it shows um, eventually, like, um, you know, as the SMA pours into you all as, as med students, when you come out of it, you're going to be able to share your experiences and the challenges and the trials in a way that allows for other students who come after you to feel comfortable coming to you and asking you for guidance. Um, and you'll be able to say that you made it through all because you never stopped. Like when you sit with um, interviewers, today is actually um, um, Kobe Bryant's birthday. Shout out to Kobe. Um, I was part of the first class that um, applied to um, medical uh, residency programs during the pandemic. So the first virtual um, interview cycle um, in medicine. And I actually channeled a little bit of the Mamba spirit because, you know, I'm from Los Angeles myself and um, decided that I was capable and that I was worthy and that um, programs needed to get to know me. They needed to get to know who I was. Um, and I think that's important um, that how you, what you say about yourself and about your failures is important because it translates to how your interviews go and the energy that you bring. Um, you are not a failure, any of you guys on this chat. In fact, there's 18 of you if we're not counting ourselves on the panel. Um, you have opportunities to go forward in this interview cycle. Um, even if we're, it's even less who are actually like fourth years and actively applying right now. And Allison, I'll answer your question in a second. Um, but you have an opportunity to like travel and visit programs um, where it's not mandatory that you go to every single interview in person. You can re you can come to Detroit and see what Detroit is like. I went to Michigan State. Um, Detroit is amazing. Like, you know, like you have opportunities to like um, visit the programs and, and reach out to residents or even sit down with program directors because this is what this time is for. It's for you. It's not the same as when you're applying to medical school and you feel like you're begging for someone to see you. No, it's a mutuality here of um, kind of a declaration of like, this is the, my program and this is what we stand for in this program. And then it's you saying, this is who I am and this is what I can bring. To answer um, your question, Allison, in terms of like, whether or not to take step one, I would say you wanna give yourself your best shot, whatever that means. Um, so with that being said, um, I would say that you should take step one um, and maybe not everybody's gonna feel that way and you can actually reach out to your top programs and ask them directly. It's a great question. It's not something that they have written on their websites. So it's a good question to ask. Um, but if you're giving yourself your best shot, I would definitely reach out. Um, I, I would I would definitely just just take it, especially because it is pass fail. I was gonna because there's been two questions that, that related to DOs. I think uh, yes, MedPeds is definitely definitely Med uh, DO friendly um, in many many ways. Um, we as many programs in both medicine, family, and the pediatric side, there's a conversion scale for your complex to what it may may be, but uh, it, I would say that the first thing that we're looking for is make sure that you pass. The second is the score. It does become that, that other yard marker that is used. But I think that that is where you, uh, particularly with the pass fail with the step now, it, we're looking for those other things. We're looking for your clinical uh, ex excellence. So if you were to ask us of letters of recommendation, um, which ones are valuable and do you have to always have a chair? There are certain programs in MedPeds and I, I I, excuse me, Jonathan, but I will say this, that are more Ivy League, <laughs> and then there's others that are maybe um, Power Five or Big Ten. For those that are Ivy, that, that's just their way. And, and again, uh, they, they would like a chair's letter. Some programs would say the chair's letter is, is, is appreciated, but we're looking for that hands-on experience. So that continuity preceptor that may have seen you for continuity clinic, or that uh, there's sub eye rotation where you got a letter. Those are things that we want to see how you're thinking, how you perform um, as a physician, even though you're not a resident. Those are things that we value. Um, some people will say, well, if that's the case, doctors, do I need to get three letters from three real letter writers and 
Should I get a chair letter or should I get two chairs? I think that's when you have to, one, know who's writing your letter. Um, uh, and two, um, think about the programs that you're applying and three, do the, the research to see what they may say on the website, what they're looking for. And four, when in doubt, contact the coordinator. No, definitely. <laughs> and and, 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 and I, I say that because the coordinator in some ways is the gatekeeper. Um, and people don't understand that because they're the ones that know our schedules. They know what kind of what we're looking for and they, they want to uphold the standards of the program too. So um, go ahead, John. Yeah, no, I was just going to say it, you know, what, um, it, it, it's funny because um, program directors know that the letters, um, the better letters are always the letters from people that know you. And, um, and the hard part is that the chair letters aren't always written by people who know you as well. So honestly, like, and so like for our program, very similar um, to, um, to Dr. Ayer's program, we don't necessarily look, we don't ask for chair letters. Many programs are pulling away from asking specifically for medicine chair letters and peace chair letters because they don't give us the richness of information that you really that you, that really helps program directors and helps you really shine as as an applicant. Um, so, but and the, you know, to the other thing about um, about step steps versus complex, um, you, um, I I completely agree about um, putting your best foot forward. But I also really think it's unfair for DO students to have to take both both step one and complex one because it's. It's a huge financial burden. On top of that, you're studying for two for two additional exams that has uh, they have very that has some allopathic information that's very similar, some osteopathic information that's, that's similar. But um, you're in school as a DO to to learn osteopathic medicine, and you should be taking the exam that reflects that. And many many residency programs are very um, transparent about the fact that. They will take complex for, and USMLE scores, and there's no expectation that you have to take both. And I think it's, um, I, I, I personally don't understand why programs insist that you take both step one and complex one. It, it makes, to me, it makes no sense. Um, but um, to, um, to, the, uh, to Dr. Ayer's point, um, look at the schools that you're interested in. If they require a complex, a complex score and a USMLE score, you don't want to discount yourself down. You don't want to put yourself at a disadvantage from that standpoint. Uh, if it's a dream program, it's a dream school. I, um, that makes complete sense um, from that standpoint. But in general, um, I, I understand the pressures to take all the all four exams, um, and I think it's I, I think it's just really unfair to to, to the other students in general. The other thing that I would say that just to, as you and again just to the, to piggyback on Jonathan, the the chair's letters are uh, really just character letters because they're writing about something they see and they're trying to you know accentuate what your character is based on an interview or the person who sits in their role has interviewed you. So that's the reason that they're not important. But again, check the programs that are out there. Make sure you do have what is needed for that program. The other question that's going to come up, and again, is that um, MedPeas has decided not to take part in the supplemental part of, uh, or uh, necessarily. Now, that doesn't mean that, and, and again, because somebody said, well, you don't want to supplement, but are you going to be a part of the signaling? And, and again, I think that this is all nuanced that we're trying to, to survey the membership. I'm speaking for Jonathan, <laughs> survey the membership <laughs> to see exactly what, how we feel about it. But I think that um, sometimes, What's old doesn't need to be changed, particularly if it's not broken. So I think that we are adapting as we, we go forward with the, the interviews being on Zoom or uh, other platforms, and we're assessing the data from that. So I think that it's important for you to know um, how we look at. And it also, as was stated, if you do and you feel like you want to see the campus, nobody's going to say, you can't come. Now it's not going to be interview. And so we're very prescriptive to tell you this is not going to change what we what happened during your interview day. It's not going to raise your rank, but it may raise questions that you can ask the program director. And I always tell people, you can ask me questions about the program all the time, even it, from the changes to things. And so don't be afraid to ask. I think that's what people, well, it may not know. Ask the question because sometimes 
those questions that you ask are just maybe the important things that are changing, maybe small and maybe big. So, and they also to give you some insight to the program that you may not have gotten through the interview process, okay? Um, because we do have limited time. We're fixated on some of the questions. We're trying to get to know you, but there may be something that you need to know about us that we didn't get to ask um, or address during the interview. Yeah. And like, and this time right now is a really great time to start reaching out to program directors. Um, MedPeace program directors are unbelievably accessible. Um, not just Dr. Ayers and I and Dr. Obo, but a lot of us in general, if, if you have a question about the residency program and you just want to sit and just talk, we, we love to, A, we love talking about our residency programs. We love talking about our residents, right? But then on top of that, we want to make sure you understand and you know what you're, you know, what, what it's like to be a resident here, what the program looks like, all those types of things. Um, you know, we get cold emails all the time, and we are and we are more than willing to have a half an hour, hour long conversation about about our program and what have you. And um, and the residents are super open to speaking and, and to meeting up and to talking to you all. Um, and you know, forums like this, forums that that Nampra is, is sponsoring. Um, the uh, NAMPRA um, conference that's coming up in October over in Anaheim. Um, all those are really great opportunities um, uh, to really get to speak more about MedPeds to program directors and residents, but then also just really get your bearings into, um, into the residency process and everything from that standpoint. So I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, on, yeah no, um, um, Dr. Tolentino was just dropping gems just now. Um, and I was about to say it myself because, um, I've done a couple of talks through the SNMA during AMEC about self-advocacy and reaching out to your top programs, um, and letting them know why you think you'd be a good fit. It not only gives you a chance to practice in an informal way, kind of like an interview or elevator kind of like pitch for yourself, but it also lets them know that your application is coming. Mm -hmm. Another thing that um, Dr. Tolentino dropped, if you guys didn't already hear it, is go visit, go come see us, you know? Um, what I um, appreciated, um, again, about this, about this virtual interview season is that you do save a lot of money um, from not having to go to every single interview in person. Um, so even if you can just take a, a and, and at the same time, like you're not expected to be in clinic really, um, depending on the, the medical school you're in during this application season. So you can interview from anywhere. Um, that's all I'm gonna say today. No, no I, I, I will say that definitely uh, uh, use your time wisely, uh, uh, feed and ask questions. One of the things I think that sometimes, uh, particularly as a URM when you're interviewing, understand that you have something that you're bringing, that you, you can add something to the program. But at the same time, you don't want to become the only you or the asset you of the program. And so don't be afraid to, to uh, first make that known during the interview. So what do I mean? You know, if somebody starts saying, if you come here, we can do this or you can do that or, you know, um, because that takes away from your interview. So you should not feel that you have to hear about what you can add as far as diversity. You're there because you want to add that diversity. That's why you're interviewing. What you want to know is what for them to get to know you and you get to know them. And so I say that very bluntly because I think you, this is quality time and you don't want to waste that time where somebody's trying to, trying to sell you on something unless you ask, okay? But you don't want to become that one or that, you know, because that, that, that is the waste. Um, and, and I, I boldly say, do speak up if that occurs, okay? The other thing is that sometimes during the interview, people will say, um, particularly if we've read your, your you know, all your um, portfolio, we may say, and, and this happens sometimes, we may, we may stop the interview and say, hey, I just wanna talk to you. Don't get nervous about that. That means that we are wanna talk to you one-on-one -on -one and we're suspending the interview because either you said something that just caught us and it, you know, set us on fire, or you may have said something that's of concern that we need to, might wanna hit on. Do not look at that as being a negative. That is how we uh, express ourselves. That's important to us because we wanna make sure that you are ready for this process. And sometimes it even comes across that 
I'm preparing you for the next interview. Okay. Um, and that's when we talk about the difference in, in, in what programs are there and what they will do. I can say without a question that that also happens within, uh, definitely within MedPeds, that we're, we're looking for you to join the MedPeds nation. I know that the Raiders moved to Inglewood, but you know, uh, but we're looking for you to be a part of the MedPeds nation. And that's the biggest overlying factor that in the end of the day, we want you to be a part of us. And if that is in Miami, if that's in Detroit, if that's in uh, Houston, um, et cetera, we want you to be happy where you're at. Because the worst thing that could be is having somebody match somewhere that they don't want to be. Um, and that is always the worry of a program director is somebody ends up that where they don't want to be. So make sure that you pick the programs that you want to be and don't, um, there's always this question, well, what if I only get seven interviews from MedPeds or what if I only get eight interviews? It's not the number, okay? Yeah, it makes you feel better, but what it is is when that door opens, are you ready to walk through it, okay? As my mother would say, knock it, and I won't say the rest because we're in a public forum, but <laughs> <laughs> knock it down because that's what we're expecting you to do, okay? And it's one of the few area, times in your life where you get to kind of be braggadocious and brag with yourself with some humbleness. So don't worry about that. And then lastly, I will say this and I'll hand it off again and shut up, is have some questions for us. Okay, the, the worst thing that is after you, I, I'm excited after I read all your personal statement and I'm, I'm interviewing you and then I say, you have any questions for me? And there's crickets. And now I'm like, wait a minute, I, I, wait a minute I, all that energy, where did it go? So it doesn't mean that you have to fabricate questions. There are some general questions that you can ask. And it doesn't mean that you have to go and research the bio or the program director and know everything they've written and stuff. It's just have questions because sometimes the simplest question can give you the question. Best question. It could be so simple as what is it that you would change if you had the opportunity to change it? Okay. What is it that you don't like about the program? And again, those type of questions, although they may say, can I ask those? I think that that's when you know how genuine the program director, when they want to address it and, head, and meet it head on, as opposed to avoiding it and not saying it. And then lastly, it is sometimes you may feel as a candidate that the interview is getting away from you. Okay that the, the person interviewing is you know, tired, they're not paying attention, then that's why you wanna ask those questions because you wanna pull them back in and say, hey, I'm here, okay? And, and undoubtedly that will happen, not a whole bunch of interviews, but it may happen. So don't be afraid to, to reach and grab and take back the control of the interview because this is your time, this is your platform, so. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think kind of, Eric, um, you, you kind of brought up that, 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 really hit, that really hits for a lot of, and I think about interviews is this is your first time in a long time when you start thinking about what do you really want out of your training program and and what is it that you really want to because you're going to I mean every med piece program you're going to learn excellent internal medicine and you're going to learn excellent pediatrics the question is what is the context what is the other what are the other parts of medicine that you want to be a part of that you want to learn more about that you want to develop and um you know, one of the things that I think is really tough when you're thinking about programs and trying to get the information is, can you get that information and are you getting that information? And, you know, if it's not in the overview, if it's not on the website or, or anything like that, um, that, that, those are the great questions that you can ask, the, that you can ask the program director, that you can ask your interviewers, because you want to leave every, every single interview feeling that the core elements that make you a physician are going to be in that program and that though the question of is this program going to be able to deliver that for me in some capacity it um is solid when you when you finish that entire interview day so if it's if 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 you if it hasn't been answered or you're still not sure ask those questions those are those are the questions and and i even recommend making sure at every single interview day that you have those two or three really important things that have to be answered or have to be addressed for you to really understand is this a program for you um, and i think um, those are the questions that as a program director that i want to be asked because i want to make sure that um, that one that we're going to meet your needs and if you know if if we're not able to meet your needs it's not that i don't want a wonderful resident in my residency program but i want to make sure that you're going to the right residency program like if you want to be if you want to be in new york and you're here in miami that's a that's that's just tough. We're not we're not in New York. Um, 
But those are those things that as you're thinking about questions, as you're thinking about like how do I how do I ask questions that aren't necessarily wrote or more importantly that you feel aren't genuinely something that are important to you that's another way to kind of reframe some of those thoughts i want to um i don't even know how to like jump on what you guys have said <laughs> very well rounded um <laughs> but i can try to answer um um a couple of the questions so so the first one um from patricio i just want to say this is a very important like question and you're going to get it a lot um, on the interview trail. Like, and it's not even like from med peds people. It's from, it's from like people in your pro in your medical school program or like people who are like wondering why you've made the decision med peds. So um, there are several reasons um, why people pursue med peds Um um, and not family medicine. And there's many reasons why people pursue family medicine um, and not med peds. Um, uh, one of my best friends is actually a, a family medicine attending now. And um, she pursued an unopposed family medicine program. And during that time, she wanted to do labor and delivery. So she did a lot of that um, um, before deciding to kind of go another route, but she had that opportunity. For med peds, I feel like the word bridge is like, such a strong um, word in terms of describing med peds and even just like on paper, um, we get more pediatrics training. Um, um, and, and I don't know if you guys have like gone in your family medicine rotations, you might've noticed that you don't like necessarily see a lot of kids, but for us, we have to see 50% adults and 50% um, children. Uh, and for me, my story was that I thought I was going to go pediatric surgery and then I hated OR culture. And then I knew I wanted to pursue peds, but then I felt, I realized that I really liked, uh, um, my medicine rotation. I really didn't expect that. And then I realized that I wanted to do pediatrics, but I didn't want to be tied to not in like a, in a, like a, condescending way, but I, I knew that I needed more than pediatrics, but I couldn't just do medicine. I needed pediatrics. Um, and so to that extent, in terms of curriculum, it's, it's hundred percent medicine and hundred percent peds. Like you rotate every three months, um, at my program, roughly, um, between pediatrics to medicine and you're covering like critical care. Like I just came out of, um, the pediatric ICU this past month. Uh, and now I'm in pediatric endocrinology before I go into, um, my medicine side, um, in terms of, um, in terms of that question, I think like being able to see the human in its fullness in terms of like not relegating pediatrics to pediatrics and adult medicine to adult medicine, but seeing the person as just someone who's like evolving. That's how I see, um, um, humans now, um, being med peds, which has led me to pursue, um, like non-reproductive like women's health or like all the things chronic illness that predispose you to like for instance like if you have high blood pressure as a young woman or 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 like have like um diabetes or any of these things that um affect your vascular health by the time you are ready to conceive you can have poor vascular health of your placenta things like that that's how i'm trying to think upstream in terms of morbidity and mortality in 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 black women and children and that's what I get to pursue um, because I'll have access to both. Uh, and lastly, um, I know the feeling of feeling apprehensive about applying to programs um, that were initially in my brain, I thought of it as like predominantly white, but now I see it as predominantly anything. <laughs> um, I, uh, and especially if it doesn't reflect the population that you serve, um, I would just say you can't, as much as we want to control from the, from the program side and then from the resident side, like where you go, where you end, where you like eventually practice and match, um, I believe you go where you're meant to be. Um, and I think like one thing that Dr. Ayers also said, and, and I'm sure um, Dr. Tolentino might've also mentioned too, but like the knowing the things that you need, um, to be successful, like whatever you needed when you were studying for your board exams through medical school, whether it was like going back home. So you had a home cooked meal and somebody to like 
you know, do your laundry while you were um, studying, like whatever you need, you, you will still need those things. Okay. Um, in terms of like how you're um, pursuing where you apply. But if you are a person who grew up in an environment where you were the only, and you feel comfortable in that, that space and it doesn't give you apprehension, um, like you're saying, then maybe that would be more comfortable for you. Um, where like, for me, micro and macro aggressions are all just aggression. And I realized real quick in med school that um, I needed diversity. And by diversity, I mean, I needed to not be the only one, period. It doesn't matter whether it is a PWI or, or, or whatever, you know? And if you know that, that helps you make decisions about where you rank or if you rank at all certain programs. For me, my top thing was I needed sunshine because seasonal affective disorder hit me so hard. JT has heard this story 15,000 times. Um, and during my interview at UM, at UM Jackson, um, one of our med peds attendings was on his balcony, you know, sipping on some water with cucumber in it on his balcony with the palm trees. And I was sitting in Michigan in the dead of winter and I, and I had a physical response where I shed a tear that I have not shed since. So you make the decisions that you can live with. And then you like, honestly, walk in like faith for me, um, that you're saying no to the programs that you truly, um, wouldn't have felt at home in. I, I will just second it. And I'm going to be very short because God, time is flying. Um, is, is, is definitely uh, apply where you want uh, and where you feel that uh, you'll be needed. I think you do have to be honest. And if you need that support and where that support is, be it family or others that are like you, uh, you do have to put that in as one of the criteria if, if that's what you need. Um, I, I will say that it, it does make a difference um, because not only mentoring, but when those days get hard and they will, um, having somebody that lifts you up and, and is able to uh, uh, converse with you in a way that you need to be conversed to and talked to, who uh, understands some of the um, apprehension that may be there or some of the roadblocks that you've experienced, or even some of the microaggressions or macroaggressions. And, and true enough, sometimes we can't change it, but acknowledging it is half the battle, um, particularly as we try to take on wellness. There's one area I just want to go back and when you, why MedPeds versus family, I'm going to be uh, very instrumental because I think that it is a, a big question. And so I think that you have to ask yourself, what is medicine, what is driving medicine? What are some of the key indices that are pushing medicine to make some of the decisions that are there? Not just, you know, disease process, but what is it we're trying to do? And so in the area of medicine that is getting a lot of interplay and play is population health. And so when you think of MedPeds and you think about changing the population, obviously we have the pediatric background, we have the internal medicine background. So that helps us. That doesn't mean that family can't because there's a collaborative that's there, but the skill set that is needed, that's what you come into question. And so I think family is needed uh, and MedPeds are, are needed. It's just where it is and the type of medicine that you want to practice. Lastly is that you can formulate what you want when you graduate. And some of that formulation of what you need for what you want, you can develop while you're in residency. There are core electives that you may be able to take um, that may give you that experience. If you're going to female woman's health, you, you, if it's not there, you could create it. There's some stumbling blocks, but those are things that can be done. If you wanna to go to tropical medicine and uh, be uh, able to go to the Caribbean and learn other things, there are, places that have that. So again, what is it that you want to have when you leave? There are things that you can do to develop it while you're in the program itself, okay? And there is a difference between health, equity, justice, and medicine and racism. So when people will talk to you, understand there's a different pathway. That doesn't mean that you avoid it, but just understand it, that you have to feel comfortable where you are. And just because you have a curriculum doesn't mean that you're gonna make me feel comfortable there. And I know that may sound controversial, but I'm gonna be as honest as I can. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Cause just having the curriculum is not gonna help you and is not going to fuel your career. Um, having you give voice to that curriculum, that's the difference. So. Yeah, and you know, I think this is also where reaching out to the residents, you know, being the only is tough and 
Um, the only way to really understand what that experience looks like in the institution is to reach out to, to the resident and to ask those questions and to ask the program directors when you do ask them how, what is, what is it that, that the institute, what are you doing? What is the institution doing? Um, and uh, and how, how does that support actually manifest itself? Um, and I think you'll, you'll get a much more honest answer because you want to make sure that um, wherever, you, wherever you put a program on that rank, you have to be comfortable with that program because you never know. The algorithm is wonky. Everybody asks me every year, how does the algorithm work? And we go, mm -hmm. and it's and it's frustrating because we wish we'd have more control over it, but it's not, it's not the easiest. And I think this is the part that we have to be really careful, that we have to just uh, understand when it comes to the rank. But um, the other thing I also recommend is within the program, so MedPeds, you know, we're, we are MedPeds and we have our own community, but then look outside into your categorical residency programs, the, the internal medicine program, the pediatric residency program. Many of our support systems also come from the categorical programs themselves and really understanding how all that, how all that interplays, um, where um, you may not necessarily get that, um, you may not see that level of diversity within the MedPeds residency itself, but it may actually exist within the internal medicine residency or the pediatric residency and really seeing, um, seeing um, where you belong may actually be in a much wider expanse. It's kind of the, um, the advantage that you, that you actually have as a MedPeds resident that you can find community, not just within the MedPeds community, but from, with, um, from, from within the larger MedPeds medicine and pediatric community itself. Um, because there are lots of really great programs that are really working on this and really, and you know, rightfully so to some extent struggling with it because uh, um, because they are trying to bring in more diversity in it, which may not have traditionally have been there. And so um, asking those tough questions and, and trying to get as honest of an of a, of a answer possible, I think is the most important way for you to really, really get that sense, kind of what, kind of to what Dr. Ayers was saying, um, is it a curriculum or is it something that they're actually doing authentically and they're actually, um, they're actually trying to, to really change systems? I had actually a wonderful um, experience with um, um, a program that I did not expect to um, um, really connect with. There was um, a NAMPRA Zoom, the National Med Peds Residency Association was holding like Zoom hosting sessions to allow for programs to connect with applicants my year. And um, I ended up having a, just a talk with a program director who came from, um, a program that was historically white. And um, he was new uh, as, an, as a program director. And he like just kind of shared, like as I shared what my interests were, he shared like the fact that he felt, he used the word embarrassed um, because the, the population was, predom was like 80% African-American. And he had a very passionate desire to see the the con like you know the con the um the population of the residency program begin to like mirror that that population of resident of, of patients that he had um and I could see he was very like honest very passionate we follow each other on Instagram now um even though I didn't go there but um there are programs that are very um very much like like-minded even if the program itself doesn't look what you would want it to look. It doesn't mean that you won't get exactly what you're looking for. Um, I think like, um, like Dr. Tolentino said, it's very important to talk to people, to talk to the residents themselves, because we, we are going to be very honest about, you know, like the fact that no program is like 100% perfect, even though I do feel like mine basically is, but I think overall, like you do your best to, um, to, um, you can't, you can't help what calls you, um, in terms of like where your, where your goals align and the programs that meet those goals for you. I would agree. And I, I tell everybody the residents are the, the voice and the face of the program. So 
please reach out to them. If they're, because we're doing Zoom, if they have a, a dinner Zoom session or a jam session, uh, don't avoid it, be a part of it. Um, I tell my residents, I want them to be as truthful as possible because this is somebody that you're trying to get to join your fold. And in that truth, you also, uh, as you uh, are talking about the program, you also can talk about not only the good and bad, but you also do some reflectology and reflection of what you need to do to improve it to the next level, because sometimes candidates will challenge you with the questions. One thing I was going to say, because I think that before we go, what should I look for? What are we looking for in step scores? And obviously the rule is step up, which means that you do better uh, when you take uh, the step. Obviously with pass and no pass, we don't know what that means. So I think that coming out the box and then where we're learning, feel if you hit 220, okay, or 216 or in that range, that will get you some uh, entrance into the door. With that entrance though, you've got to be able to explain who you are, why, and why this is a career for you, okay? Yeah, everybody's going to want um, higher scores, but I think that that's where Mary Pease also realizes that individual life is. And so we want people that live life um, and then also bring life to the program. And mm -hmm. that's, we don't want to avoid that, so. No, definitely. And you know, the other thing I always say is, um, if, if you're struggling and trying to figure out what to do next with the in med peds, talk to a med peds physician or talk to somebody in NAMPRA or talk to somebody in the NPPDA. Um, the reason is because sometimes you don't get great advice about med peds from those who, who have never applied or, or don't understand the world of med peds. Um, and what, what often ends up happening is medical students end up getting discouraged when they should be encouraged and they should, and they should continue to apply. We've had, I've had, I've worked with many a medical student um, who said, my scores were told, they told me my scores were terrible and I should apply for med peds. And I said, who, who are you talking to? And you should never talk to them again. That, that um, your, your scores are fine, but more importantly, you're doing amazing things that any MedPeace program director would absolutely want in their residency program. And whoever has told you that has so only saw you as a, as a 215 or a 216 and wrote you off. And MedPeace program directors, we, we, understand, we understand what the holistic review really is supposed to do, as opposed to you look at the numbers, then you do a holistic review, which is um, uh, completely backwards. And we really are trying to, we really are taking that holistic review of each applicant. Um, and I think that's I think that's the part that um, that if if you if you feel like you're getting bad advice or you think you're being discouraged, reach out to um, to Dr. Ayers, to me, to uh, to Dr. Obo. All of us will be able to actually give you a much better understanding of where you actually should land, and more importantly, um, um, better guide us into actually how to enter into the entire um, interview season. And with that, my goodness, this was amazing. Thank you again uh, to all of our students in the audience. Thanks for spending this hour with us. My goodness, Dr. Tolentino, Dr. Ayers, and my goodness, Dr. Ovo, thank you for joining and giving your perspective as a resident. That's so critical. Um, if you aren't inspired like I am, then I would be shocked. So thank you guys for your time. The recording of uh, this webinar is gonna be available on the Torque for Diversity YouTube channel. So feel free uh, to check that out there. And uh, with that, we will close it out. Thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful panelists. Thank Thanks, you guys. <laughs>